Let's go to our sermon time. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John 3, and we'll start at verse 26. I'm going to go back about five years. John 3, starting at verse 26. And they came unto John, that's John the Baptist, and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Probably wanting to know what John thought of it. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness uh, that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent to uh, before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above, uh, is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Start right there. I want to talk about the, 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 the subject of glorifying Jesus Christ. Um, it's amazing the things people spend their time emphasizing as believers, and much of it has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus Christ. If you want to elevate Jesus, if you want to elevate, I hate to use the word because it's so misused, but if you want to promote Christianity, you have to promote Christ. They, they can't be separated. You don't promote your church you know, basketball team. You don't promote your favorite movie night. Uh, you don't promote the fact that your church just finished building a, a, a gymnasium, calling it the Family Life Center. I get so sick of that, these gobbledygook terms. Um, we had a we had a men's softball team years ago, but it wasn't a church league. We just joined a city league and put up a team and lost a lot. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a lot better, a lot cheaper and simpler than worrying about your church, our church, that church. We're all going to be in the same church league. Church league softball teams are real big in the South. A lot of churches down there, and very few of those Southerners know how to witness to, for Jesus Christ. It's honestly, honestly true. I was thinking about the term Bible believer. Some of you think that Bible believers are Baptists. No, they're not. Most Baptists in the United States are not Bible believers. They go to a church with a sign that says Baptist on the building. That's all they know. The pastor pussyfoots around with 15 different other translations and doesn't believe any single one of them is the Word of God. But, um, let me to get to our text. When you think of words, <clears throat> the word down doesn't have many positive associations. And uh, when you attach it to other words, it brings those words down as well. It's the word for cowards. It's a word for losers. It's a word for bums. It's a word for people who are unachievers. 
Uh, and it brings other words down too. We hear the word break down. We had to downsize the company, so you lost your job. Such things as uh, he's down and out. Uh, the downfall of this or that. Breakdown. Downsize. Face down. A downer. Run down. The stock market is up or the stock market is down. The only positive association might be the word touchdown. <laughs> but only if it's your team. The word up has many positive associations. Positive meanings. It's used for winners. It's used for achievers. It's used for heroes. And uh, when you attach it to other words, it brings those words up as well. Uh, he's up and coming. Uh, he's upstanding in his community. He's an upscale. He's an upscale neighborhood, uh, and so forth. We've been brainwashed to think that the only direction of success is to move up. Well, we're moving on up, moving on up. Anyway. And uh, Americans particularly, but people throughout the world have been brainwashed to think that up is the only direction of success or achievement or, or betterment. And... Um, People rise to fame. They ascend to greatness. And we, we all buy into that thinking. So the words of John the Baptist are foreign to our ears when he says of Christ, He must increase, but I must decrease. That seems so foreign to us, so contrary to our thinking. We want more from God but we don't want to go after it the way God wants us to go after it. Heard that song, I think Bette Midler sang it, uh, You Are the Wind Beneath My Wings. She's soaring as a celebrity, and she takes the time to sing how much she praises her loved one behind her who was always behind the scenes helping her out. You don't hear that sentiment uh, offered very often, not, not by celebrities or singers. Um, when we look at the Lord Jesus, we believe we should have more of him. We believe he wants more of us. Like I say, we don't want to go after it the way he tells us to. Um, yet we get caught up in the world around us, in the world's philosophy, in the world's thinking, that uh, in order to um, move up, you have to ascend and exalt yourself and promote yourself. My wife works with uh, works for a boss who has no real patience, no real kindness, compassion, empathy for anyone else underneath her because she's busy promoting herself. And um, secretly, everybody despises her. One of these days, it's not going to be secret. Someone's going to blurt it out, and she's going to get egg on her face. But um, we get caught up in this world thinking that the only way to ascend is to go up. Everything has to be moving up, and we have to promote ourselves. Uh, then, if, if God can still reach our conscience and still stir us from time to time, we have a new twinge of conviction. We realize, I'm on the wrong track. I've been thinking the wrong way. And we want more from God if he'll grant it to us once again. Paul wrote that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3, verse 10. When someone ridicules you or raises an eyebrow at you, or they say something snide about church or Christianity, they know you, you're 
devoted at church. They know you believe in Christ and you believe in the Bible. You believe in salvation. They can't get at Jesus Christ indirectly. So they get at you directly if they can. And at that moment, when someone says something, makes a gesture, does something that slightly offends you, it may not be suffering, it may not be harsh, harshness, but uh, at that moment, suddenly you are closer to Jesus Christ than you were five minutes before. You can't help but feel and sense that with the Savior. And he seems closer to you than he was just a moment before. I've said before, the local church exists for three reasons. Three primary reasons. I have a sermon to the, of these three points. To evangelize the sinner. To edify the saint. And thirdly, to exalt the Savior. If our work, if our church, if our ministry does not uh, seek to uh, exalt the Savior and to elevate Jesus Christ and promote Jesus Christ and praise Jesus Christ and glorify Jesus Christ and brag about Jesus Christ and boast about Jesus Christ, then our church is worthless. Our church is doing nothing. We're just meeting in a building on Sunday morning to sing a few old hymns together and then go home, then go, then go out to lunch somewhere. And John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So I want to consider some of those points today. Um... Paul received his, uh, or rather, Paul, <clears throat> reading my handwriting here, he recalled his own testimony, his life as a Pharisee, uh, and his zeal uh, for the law uh, of Moses, and his antagonism and bitterness toward the gospel of Christ as it was being preached. But then when he came to know Jesus Christ, he said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for, the, for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, uh, of Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. Then he said a little bit later, and do count all things but dung that I may win Christ. I was reading that one time and jumped out at me and you know what I, I I realize what Paul just said. Paul just said, whatever I achieved, whatever I can lay claim to is a big pile of you know what alongside knowing Jesus Christ personally. You can have a lot of religion and have nothing real. You can go to a church and have no knowledge of God whatsoever. But for the true believer, he wants to uh, increase Jesus Christ. By so doing, or in so doing, he draws men to Jesus Christ. Christ say in John chapter 3, If I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. So the way to advance Christianity, advance the gospel of Christ, is to promote Christ. You're not here to promote uh, anything else. Point number one today, if you're going to take some, some notes, I'll try to go through these smoothly. Point number one, he is increased when self is minimized. Self is minimized. Believe it or not, most people didn't come to church today to see what you're wearing. Oh, they may, they may notice what you're wearing and laugh at it later, but they didn't come here just to see your fashion show. Um, the Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. 
Proverbs 16, verse 18. The Bible says, If a man thinketh himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Galatians 6, verse 3. John the Baptist had told the people uh, coming to him, There cometh one mightier than I, the latchet of... Uh, <laughs> mightier than I, after who, uh, excuse me, after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Mark 1, verse 7. He said, I'm not even um, worthy as a servant to get down on the ground and untie Christ's shoes. That's how magnificent he is alongside me. How many Christians think that way about Jesus Christ? Not very many. Not very many. We live in a world where everybody's promoting themselves, and they think that somehow I can promote Christ at the same time. It's got to be one or the other. You can't take the place of Christ. He can sure take the place of you. Paul wrote, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself, more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans 12, verse 3. You should be sober-minded, clear-headed, recognize what your talents are and your weaknesses are, what you're good at, what your education level is, what's, what you're qualified to do, and be honest. Don't be something you're not. Don't try to promote yourself as something that you're not see a lot of that in Christianity today. Uh, everyone has met someone who can't help but put their nose in other people's business. They think by being interested in what other people are doing, trying to stay on top of everyone else's gossip, it will make them look better. You're at work, you're at school, somebody who just can't mind their own business and they want to give the boss advice about what he ought to do with that other employee. I've seen that. Um, but you know what? It, it doesn't promote them. All it does is exposes them in the eyes of everyone else. It really does. And by belittling or demeaning the, uh, the reputation of others, they seem to think they will advance themselves and promote themselves eventually. But it, it never works out quite that way. Have you ever noticed how Muslims use um, the, the name of Allah? You see them on a TV talk show. And they'll say, uh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, blessings be upon him. He went to Medina in a certain year, blessings be upon him. And they seem to think if they interject that phrase, the rest of us will be convinced of it. We don't judge them by what they say. We judge them by what their religion has done, their history, their actions, their terrorism, the fact that they've uh, sought to destroy the Jew for, for 1,400 years. <laughs> See, Pastor Schreiber, you do you like making fun of other people's religions? Yeah, I do. But when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, the way to increase Him is to minimize self. We don't have to tag on and add on all of these great things about Jesus, just some little praise phrase, uh, Jesus, blessings be upon him. We don't have to do that. The reputation of Jesus speaks for itself. Do you know something? The, the world has never been the same since the Lord Jesus Christ graced its roads, graced its uh, streets, preached. One man, everyone's probably heard the poem, you know, One Solitary Life, but uh, one man whose 
life was so flawless and impeccable, never committed a sin, never uttered a perverse word, never gave a false impression, uh, and never committed a sin so that he had, Christ never had to go to the temple, offer a sacrifice, and then when he died, he had no sins at all that needed to be repented of or, or forgiven of. He was being crucified and punished on behalf of you and be, on, on behalf of me. And uh, the Bible says in the book of Matthew, the scribes were envious. Uh, Pilate knew that for envy, they had delivered Christ to be crucified. He had multitudes, thousands, following him every day, hanging on every word. They couldn't get people to follow them across the street. And then the children running through the streets, praising Christ, crying after him. This made the, the priests and the Pharisees even more angry. And so they had to devise some way to lie about him and accuse him of blasphemy and accuse him of all kinds of crimes so that he would be crucified and they could get to get rid of him and say, he's, we're done with him. We don't need him anymore. But uh, he had the last laugh. <laughs> three days and three nights later, he came back to life and uh, appeared in glorified power and ascended in glorified power. And you and I are waiting to go and uh, rejoin him. We're waiting to be raptured and caught up with him. I do believe in the rapture. I do believe it's coming soon. And uh, with all the crazy things going in, going on in the country, in the world right now, and political uh, elections, and I had a friend I spoke to who wanted to encourage me when I told him about my medical issues. He said, you know what, I would vote for Biden if it would hasten the rapture. <laughs> I guess that's one motivation for it. But Jesus Christ is increased when self is minimized. Secondly, let me go to this point. He is increased when sin is mortified. When sin is mortified. That means to put it to death. To kill it. Knock it off. Quit doing it. Reject it every time it comes. Every time the temptation or the impulse comes. Don't do it. Uh, the Bible says, "For If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Romans 8 verse 13. Not the, not the needs of the body. You still have to eat and drink and sleep and those kinds of things. But the deeds of the body, those things that are contrary to the virtue, to the purity of Jesus Christ. You say, well, you, you make it sound so simple, so cut and dry, so easy to do. I wish it was easy to do. All we can do is sort of simplify it and give ourselves something to dwell on and meditate on and work toward. That's how you get started. Then Paul lists some of the, uh, the works of the body, the things, the deeds of the body that shouldn't be done. Colossians 3 verse 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, and then he gives examples. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, that's a good old word, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Peter writes, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which is, hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. 1 Peter 1.14 um, he describes Jesus Christ by saying, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 
the Lord Jesus never had to deceive someone to trick them into hearing him, listening to him. I wrote a little tract about 10 years ago called The Dirty Little Secret of Jehovah's Witnesses. I made it small, put that title on it just to pique someone's interest. And the truth is, Jehovah's Witnesses admit in their books, nobody knows how to pronounce the name Jehovah. They just say Jehovah because people have heard it before. And then they go so far to say, if you disagree with him, you'll never enjoy eternal life. So I, I put that title on just to pique someone's interest into picking it up and reading it. That's, that was um, guile. That was a little bit of guile to trick you into picking it up and uh, seeing for yourself what it might say. But the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, uh, had no guile in his mouth. He never had to be dishonest or misleading or tricky to get people to follow and to listen. His actions spoke for himself. His purity spoke for itself. Uh, Peter writes, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according... Oh, we just read that. I'm sorry. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2, 24. Paul writes, <clears throat> For he hath made him... Christ to be sin for us. God hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us. He became the personification of sin, the embodiment of sin, uh, so that he could die as a substitute for all of us simultaneously. Second Peter, or rather, Second Corinthians 5, verse 21. And the Apostle John would later write, and you know that he was, man he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Hard to wrap your mind around that concept, that in Jesus Christ there, there is no sin. There never was any sin. There never will be any sin. His life was so pure and flawless that when he died, he wasn't dying for any sin of his own. He was dying for the sins of all men and women everywhere. The Apostle John would later write, And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin, 1 John 3, 5. The simple fact is, if there was no sin present in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, if there was no sin, no wickedness, no offense that could ever be accused uh, of Christ, then neither should there be in you. Neither should there be in you or in me. My life should be set to increase Christ and minimize myself to mortify sin. When you mortify or put to death any urge to do wrong, to sin, do something contrary to the purity and the, the virtue of God Almighty, Jesus Christ is increased. And in so doing, you are decreased, which is how it ought to be. Thirdly, let me say this. He is increased when there is singleness of mind. When there's singleness of mind. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one accord, or excuse me, with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, verse 5 and 6. All Christians should be working toward the same objective, 
You should be of the same mind. You should be of the same goal. If each one came to the meeting house and had the same desire to praise God together, to enjoy fellowship and friendship with each other, and uh, concentrate on how do we praise Jesus Christ, how much more glorious could our singing be? How much more glorious would our testimonies be when, when I get you to give one? I have a hard time getting you to testify for Jesus Christ. Thank God for something that he does for you during the week. He opens an opportunity to talk to somebody. You have a chance to give someone a track. You have a chance to talk to and answer someone's questions. You don't have to unload everything on them at one time. I've noticed Christians, I don't know about here, but maybe so, but I have noticed Christians in the past, they're really zealous. They've got a lot of zeal and enthusiasm. I knew a lady, she was a, she and her husband ran a, they're old Italians, they ran a nightclub in Chicago years ago. And she told us how she'd see the local bishop and a couple of mafiosos come in and take the booths together and eat dinner together, and that's just the way life was. And then she gets saved, and she, I think her husband passed, but she got saved, started working for Dr. Alberto Rivera, and uh, became an, a Catholic hater. She became so zealous and so eager to win lost Catholic ladies to Jesus Christ. But she didn't know how to control it. So a lady would come visit our Bible study where we were at, and she'd start educating this lady about Catholicism and uh, doctrines and the King James Bible and everything else, and overload this poor soul, hoping to do some good, hoping to really enlighten her, and then the lady would never come back again. She was just overwhelmed. So you got to be tactful. You have to be mindful. Not everybody is like that. Um, I spoke to one of our missionaries years ago. He said, where I'm at, you don't have time to knock on a door and hope in six months the person might be interested in coming to visit your church. You have to get right to it when you can because you may never see them again. <clears throat> so he told me how he did it. And... But here in America... And in other Western countries, it's like pulling teeth, you know, without any anesthetic. Nobody likes that. And getting someone interested in hearing more about Jesus Christ by overwhelming them with too many books, too many tracts, too many pamphlets, too much literature may have the reverse effect. It really may. It may have the opposite effect. So you have to be tactful. Christ said, um, wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. And that's the philosophy every believer ought to have. But when every believer is of the same mind, and uh, he's of singleness of mind, he wants to win lost people to Jesus Christ, things can get done, and God can bless. And if... Um, But as I said, if, if each person came with the idea that we're going to try and win someone to Jesus Christ, or we're going to try and lay a great testimony before them so they've got nothing to accuse our church of, they can say, yeah, that was a nice group of people. I, I'd like to go back there again. That's the way it is here in the U.S. But then uh, Jesus Christ is increased because we're of singleness of mind. I'm going to move along now. Point number uh, four. He is increased when the scriptures are modeled. The scriptures are modeled. That is, you are devoted and uh, committed to the Word of God, the written scriptures, the written Word of God. Those things become more important to you. Do you know, uh, we call ourselves Bible believers. And I've been thinking about that term. What is a Bible believer? So I tried to whittle it down to its simplest definition. 
We hear the phrase a lot, our church believes the Bible, he's a great Bible believer, she's a good Bible believer. But what exactly does it mean? How can we clearly understand it? One who believes the copies of the Old Testament and New Testament that he holds in his hands and can read in his own language, make the Bible a perfect revelation from God in the form of a book. He doesn't need to update it, modify it, improve it, second guess it. He simply believes it as it is. Every word, every punctuation mark, he realizes one day he's going to have to answer to God for it. That man is a Bible believer. Now, to the degree he reads it, that becomes a second issue between him and the Lord. But that's the Word of God. It's the same one his mother and father raised him on, his grandparents perhaps. That's the Word of God. It's always been the Word of God. His job isn't to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change him, all right? By contrast, one who believes only the original manuscripts are the words of God somewhere. He can't be a Bible believer because the original manuscripts have never been found. They've never been discovered. All men have ever had were copies of copies transmitted over the centuries from which to work and translate. Someone might say, well, the original manuscripts were the inspired words of God, but no such claim can be made for a translation. That person's also not a Bible believer. When the Greek writers of the New Testament quoted from the Hebrew Old Testament, which they did about 200 times, didn't they have to translate? And if all the Hebrew scriptures had been rendered into Greek 250 years before Christ, supposed the supposed Septuagint, by this measure, the Bible read by Christ and the disciples in the synagogue, Luke chapter 4 later, wasn't inspired either. It's hard to imagine Jesus not having a perfect Bible. Someone might say, well, all translations of the Bible are equally the same, and arguing over one or the other is a matter of personal preference. It's not that important. That person's certainly not a Bible believer. He thinks his own intellect and reasoning skills are sufficient to judge spiritual things. Someone might say, well, there is one version of the Bible which is the best of all. It's been the best for generations. It just has a few mistakes that need to be corrected as we go. That person's certainly not a Bible believer. If there's one error, perhaps there are many. One mistake would constitute an imperfect Bible. It would be impossible then to define the term Bible believer as we did just a minute ago. One who believes every single word from cover to cover. I was in a restaurant oh, 20 years ago. There's a guy sitting there and he had a new Schofield reference Bible and he had a copy of Nestle's Greek New Testament and I think he was trying to teach himself how to read the New Testament in Greek and uh, see if it was right in English. But I, had just, I was just fresh out of Bible school and I was raring to go find somebody to talk to. Um, I said, I, what are you reading there? And he told me. Of course, I could see what it was. So I played ignorant. I said, let me ask you something. I've often wanted to ask. Maybe you're a good, mind, good guy to ask. Do you think that there's one perfect Bible, one possible Bible in English that was translated from cover to cover and no one needs to doubt it? All you need to do is believe it. You wouldn't have to change a word in it. It's, it, it, it God finally got it right and uh, no one just has to keep redoing it again. He thought for a moment and he said, I don't think there is a book like that. Say, so, well, I guess I disagree. I, I believe there is. And um, 
But that's the mentality of so many preachers. Go to one of these big Christian book, Christian churches that has a bookstore, and they've got five, six, seven different translations for sale in their bookstore. What, the, what that means is the pastor who's in charge doesn't believe any single one of those Bibles is a perfect Bible. It's just, you pick one, I'll pick one, everybody just pick one, and it doesn't really matter. It does matter. But um, he's increased when the scripture is modeled. I think I said this earlier in the year, Jack Van Impey, the walking Bible, passed away, went to heaven. Brother and Sister Everett, I think, were members of his church years ago. But uh, his reputation was to have had uh, somewhere between 13 and 20,000 verses of the Bible committed to memory. And he could recite chapter and verse when he needed to. He did a great job. He, he, he uh, would quote, rather he would memorize four, maybe five verses together, all on the same subject. And keep that together in his mind. So that when he wanted to recite a verse on a topic... He would recite it, and then he would go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. He was five verses ahead of anybody who wanted to argue with him. Modern preachers, they just want to say, well, yeah, he memorized a lot of the scripture, but it was all King James. What do you mean it was all King James? They're trying to cover the fact that they don't know any scripture. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. If you pray without ceasing, you're modeling the scriptures. The Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. The only way the word of God will ever work effectually in your heart or in the life of any man or woman, is if that man and woman receive what they're reading as the words of God. If they take it as good advice, it has no effect. It'll have, it'll have no influence. It'll bring forth no benefit, no fruit. Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 18, verse 1. That's scripture. You know, quit quitting... And start praying. That's what you ought to do. Quit quitting and start praying. Cast off anything that keeps posing a temptation to you and corrupting you and distracting you and getting your mind off things of God and things that are clean and decent and onto the will of God and the word of God. The Bible says the Bereans, quote, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily uh, with all readiness of mind uh, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Acts 17, verse 11. You want to be the kind of Christian who searches the scriptures. I work with some nice men at, at my job. And they're, they're big uh, into their church customs and their church traditions. So they have fancy robes they wear as ministers on Sunday. One's a pastor of a church. The other's an elder in that denomination. And these men don't know anything about the Bible at all. No, they don't. They couldn't quote a verse to you, couldn't cite a verse to you if their lives depended on it because their denomination is pushes appearance and clothing and customs and church traditions. Uh, one man gave me a handbook. It was a description of their church denominations beliefs. And they list the summary of the gospel. They have a summary of water baptism, the things they believe and a page, page and a half, maybe. And then they had 24 pages explaining the different roles of vestments and robes and costumes and things they wear. That's what their emphasis is. 
It's on appearance. I felt very sad, but... I know a liberal church in this area, and uh, they, their slogan on their literature is, we don't do your thinking for you. That's a sort of a, a, sort of a side swipe at churches who actually believe in reading the Bible and teaching the Bible. We don't do your thinking for you. The, tr the truth is they don't do any thinking at all. Their, their female minstrel, she offers one 20-minute sermonette on Sunday morning each week. Um, it's just a little you know, upbeat, you know, uh, encouragement, positive thinking message. And uh, that's all she does. She does nothing else during the week and gets paid 120 grand a year. I wonder if she needs any help. I was thinking of going over there. <laughs> but um, I'm going to try to move along here. Lastly, well, before I move along, let me say, uh, I think I mentioned this a few months ago when I was talking about Jack Van Impey. He went to heaven and his great reputation was having uh, and being able to cite and recite and quote scripture verbatim chapter and verse when he wanted to when he needed to as he needed to and uh, nobody could touch him and I think I issued this challenge once before to some of you Korean men actually we have we have more non-Korean men here today than we do uh, Korean men this is or just about, maybe 50-50. But to take the Korean King James Bible and you commit it to memory and be able to quote verse and verse and verse, chapter and verse, cite it when you need it, and you become the walking Bible of the Korean King James community. <laughs> no one's done that yet. And time's a wasting. And the rapture may come very soon. And... Um, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to neglect things that you could do and uh, you could be known for and have the respect and honor of other believers by doing so. Or the King James text or the English text. Doesn't matter. But he is, lastly, he is increased when the spirit is minded. He is increased when the Spirit is minded. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit. And he said in John 16, 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The job of the Holy Spirit is not to promote and advance himself. His job is to promote Jesus Christ. When the, I wish the Pentecostal brethren could get a hold of this. I really wish they could. When uh, they start their church meetings, Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Holy Spirit, descend on us. Holy Spirit, control our singing. Holy Spirit, control our preaching. Holy Spirit, control our joy and our emotion. Holy Spirit, do this and that. Holy Spirit, fill this, fill that. That person's not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the Muslims trying to force the idea of Muhammad. You know, Pentecostals keep saying, Holy Spirit, do this. They're not filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to minimize himself and glorify Jesus Christ. And you, you do that, and that's done when your nose is in the Bible, and it's not simply flitting around with emotionalism. Too many churches and too many denominations go from emotion to emotion to emotion uh, and they don't seem to know the, the, the will of the Holy Spirit because they're not reading the Word of God. And lastly, I guess this is the last point, point number six. He is increased when saints are multiplied, 
when saints are multiplied. This goes back to one of the points of the local church, to evangelize the sinner. Everyone ought to know that an unsaved man, unsaved woman, needs to be born again. I was born again November 5th, 1967. Just a little over 53 years ago, last week. And uh, it's been a blessing to be standing here right near the spot where I got on my knees and prayed to God to forgive me. So that's been a great encouragement and a great reminder and great reinforcement. And uh, I've never forgotten it. It's been the greatest memory of my childhood. I pray that it never fades. But every saint ought to be mindful of another sinner coming to Jesus Christ. When saints are multiplied, uh, Jesus Christ is increased. You and I collectively make up the body of Jesus Christ. We make up the church together. So as the, the, the body of Jesus Christ grows and spreads throughout the universe, how much more glorious does that make Jesus Christ? How much more can we increase him because someone else has been saved? My father used to cite a poem, when I enter the portals of heaven and the saved all around me appear, I want to hear someone saying it was you who invited me here. That's what you and I want to hear.